Thank you, Marge. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you very much for joining today's dialogue. Um, this webinar is being recorded um, and we, we, we will make it available um, to everyone in the coming days. Um, so I'm just going to kick off. Um, I think we have quite a few people. I'm just going to kick off. Um, my name is Fikayo. Um, I'm the Africa China uh, Program Officer at the African Climate Foundation. Um, the African Climate Foundation is the first African-led um, strategic grant maker working at the nexus of climate change and development. Uh, we believe that climate change interventions have immense potential to unlock new opportunities for development in Africa. And we are actively working on ways to rethink de development framing. And we're effectively working with our partners, including the FDP, to understand how we can effectively start to bring climate change to the forefront of development thinking and planning in Africa. Um, today, our key speakers, our, our guest speakers are from the African Development Bank. Uh, first, we have Dr. Vanessa Uche. She's a natural resource economist and the acting director of the African Natural Resources Management and Investment Center at the AFDB. She has over 20 years of experience in natural resources policy. She has worked in various roles in policy think tanks, civil society, the private sector, and multilateral organizations. She joined the African Development Bank in 2018, and she currently heads the Economic and Policy Analysis Division in the African Natural Resources Management and Investment Center. In this role, she leads a team of experts to generate knowledge and provide advice and technical assistance to the bank's regional member countries on natural resources policies and investments. Dr. Uche holds a doctorate in economics from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. We also have Mr. Jerry Kwame Ahaje, a mining specialist with over 25 years experience in natural resource management, research policy analysis and implementation and mineral sector regulation. Mr. Jerry Ahaje is currently the Chief Minerals Officer at the African Natural Resources Management and Investment Center at the AFDB, and he's contributing his quota to the implementation of the Africa mining vision in several countries on the continent. He also leads the development of Africa's green mineral strategy. And today, both of our key speakers um, will be effectively talking to us about exploring Chinese investments in Africa's um, critical mineral sectors. They will walk us through some of the work they're doing with the FDB and some of their key insights um, coming, out of, um, coming out of their expertise. And we'll effectively be able to ask them questions and get more insights from them. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining. Um, if you have any questions, I'll just ask um, that you use the Q&A box um, as opposed to the chat, um, just because I think it's going to be very difficult to control the chat. So please, if you have any questions for our panelists or for myself, please use the Q&A box, um, the Q&A option um, at the bottom of your Zoom, um, your Zoom screen. Um, so yeah, we'll kick off at this point. Uh, Mr. Haji, um, Dr. Uche, can we have your videos just so we can interact with you? All right, wonderful. So you're muted, Mr. Haji. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, hello, yes. All right, cool, yes, wonderful. So right 
Were you asking me to speak? Yes, I was asking if you'd like to take the mic at this point. Oh, okay. So let me defer to Dr. Ushi to do the presentation. Um, Vanessa? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, let me start the presentation. Okay, I hope you can see. We can. Yes, so good morning um, to Ms. Uh, Picayo Akere Dolo. I hope I got the pronunciation yes. right. Uh, <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you and did. And colleagues in the Africa Climate Foundation and uh, participants joining this uh, event. Thank you so much for inviting me to share my thoughts on a very important topic for Africa. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Jerry Hadjit, who is our chief minerals officer in the bank. So Jerry is our mining and minerals guru. <laughs> so I'm going to make like a 10 minute presentation and then Jerry can really dive in on our green minerals work. Um, but just to set the scene and to share some thoughts on what we see as the key issues in uh, Africa's critical minerals, we call them green minerals, but you know, there's this thing about terminology um, and the way forward given Chinese or China's heavy investments in this area. Okay, so first of all, the outline of the presentation, a brief background, on the, the emerging context for critical minerals, um, some description of the energy transition and how minerals will actually drive this transition. Looking at uh, demand for lithium ion batteries for which Africa has uh, abundance of these green minerals. And then the green minerals potentials in particular, some geopolitical factors that we see coming into play in policies on green transition and energy security. And then China's role in global value chains, China's footprint in the, the critical mineral sector in Africa, then what we call a win-win, not a win-lose. <laughs> in other words, how can Africa benefit? What are the strategies? We now go to opportunities in, in batteries and electric vehicles, EVs. And then smart partnerships, smart partnerships that create that win-win for Africa and some final thoughts. Okay, so first of all, some background on the African Development Bank. It is, of course, uh, the leading multi multilateral development bank in Africa, serving Africa's development interests. We have five strategic priorities, which we call the high fives, focused on energy, that's light and power Africa, feed Africa, agriculture, industrialized Africa, obviously industrialization, regional integration, integrate Africa, and then sustainable and inclusive development when we say improve the quality of life for Africa. So this is the framework that we've been following for about seven years now under the current president, Dr. Akimumia Desina. And we see that natural resources contribute to achieving all of these priorities. So why are natural resources important? The most recent analysis that we did in this year's African Economic Outlook, which is uh, published right now and available online, it shows that over 60% of Africa's GDP is dependent on renewable and non-renewable resources and vital ecosystem services. In other words, Africa's economy is resource driven, and this is a fact and reality. Uh, so for us as a bank, we see this sector as an area in which we can really influence uh, the pathways for sustainable development, for climate resilience and energy transition. 
So the motivation behind setting up our department, the African Natural Resources Management and Investment Center with the acronym ANRC. I know it's a, it's a mouthful, but you just think of ANRC and then you get it. So we focus directly on natural resources management. And it's really about supporting the regional member countries, that's the African countries who are members of the bank, to use these resources effectively for economic and social transformation. So we've been in existence since 2013. We provide knowledge, policy advice, technical support, some type of advocacy on best practices, lessons from other countries which have done these successfully to help transform local economies. Since last year, we are going through a strategic renewal process. So this is why we now have this investment angle in our title. It wasn't there in 2013, but we have a new agenda and it's how do we prepare the natural resources sector in Africa for the future, for the just energy transition, for the green economy, and to really build climate ready African economies in general. So our strategy has three pillars. One is obviously on good governance. This is a major concern of the bank because we see it as a key driver of growth. And then what we call valuing natural capital. We want to move the debate from natural resources simply as commodities to natural resources as assets. So how do we capitalize these resources to convert them into different types of assets. And then finally, facilitating investment in these natural assets. So it's something that you see heavily featuring in, in the bank's narratives on natural resources and which I'll dwell on a bit in my presentation. So first of all, we looked at metal demand uh, from lithium ion batteries under the net zero scenario. What this chart is showing is that minerals are going to drive the energy transition and we're seeing massive increases in demand in the long term. But also a lot of these critical minerals are found in Africa. So we do have a natural advantage. The question is how do we convert this into opportunities? And again, there are constraints around how the global markets and global environment is structured. We've seen that when there are shocks to the system, including the Ukraine conflict recently or COVID-19, uh, even the role of Russia in producing some of these uh, critical minerals, it really affects Africa's own mining sector our mining outputs and our economies, which depend heavily on mining. So there's some level of interconnectedness globally between Africa uh, and the geopolitical environment. But the important message from here is that I don't think people realize how much energy intensity is required to transition to net zero. And it's going to be driven by minerals and mining. You could say it's a paradox, but this is just the reality. And it's a question of how can we now transform mining, uh, especially in Africa, to ensure that we are benefiting from this anticipated growth in demand. So again, we look at electric vehicles uh, and the batteries used in these electric vehicles. And we again see very high growth by 2030. Uh, and this is because of changes in regulation, such as freezing out internal combustion engines, uh, tax credits, incentives, which are actually favoring green technologies, green transportation. So this is a global movement. These are global changes. And actually it's causing an increase in demand for the raw materials to make either uh, the EVs or the batteries. But we see that in Africa, we've not really uh, embraced these new technologies, including EVs and, and even batteries. And I think it's because of lack of awareness, as well as uh, a lot of focus on other sources of energy. But there is potential to really scale some, mar some markets and sectors. I was, we've seen in our analysis, two or three wheelers, like motorbikes, 
yes, this is where we see some potential in, in applying clean energy technologies. So in summary, these two slides are just showing us the potential in the green transition for Africa's uh, critical minerals. The market is going through a massive structural change. Uh, there's a huge increase in demand. It's fueled by regulate, regulations, incentives, but also that people are starting to embrace uh, these new tech technologies in other parts of the world, a bit less in Africa, but this is simply a huge change in, uh, in the markets, which we can take advantage of. So this chart is just showing you, when we say abundance, you can now really understand that some of the critical minerals are really um, majorly present in Africa. We have abundant deposits, whether it's cobalt or, or lithium or nickel or manganese, uh, And an important one in DRC. And in West Africa, we see new frontiers for lithium. And this increasing exploration, which is bringing forth more discoveries. So you could say that uh, Africa is the next big frontier for uh, critical minerals. And just to drive from the message that we have the natural endowment, we have the natural opportunity. But as I said, opportunities have to be converted into tangible assets. And this is where uh, finance, investments, and policies come in. So we talked about geopolitical movements. We see that in other parts of the world, they are positioning their economies and their regions for the green transition. Whether it's uh, individual countries like the, the UK or the US, uh, all the G7 countries, and then of course the European Union, uh, other jurisdictions, I mean, other jurisdictions, in fact, they have green, uh, green economy transition plans or critical mineral plans or energy security policies. And it's focused on access. So that's why I said energy security and having supplies which can feed their economic uh, growth, but also ensuring value addition in their economies uh, processing and complying with global climate regulation. So what do we see in some of these uh, strategic frameworks? On the left is just some key bullet points for the EU Green Deal. And we see that uh, it's really talking about limiting um, consumption for extraction and encouraging domestic processing. Also, uh, efficiency, looking at recycling and diversifying sources of supply. So no single country is going to be able to control the market or the supply route. And then the UK, again, you see the emphasis on domestic capability, domestic processing, domestic industry, global collaboration with partners uh, and how they can influence market structure. So what do we see in general ac across the world in, in these new geopolitical trends? As I said, the domestic markets, domestic capabilities, domestic industry, uh, improving risk monitoring. So how do they respond to risk and disruptions to supply chains, creating incentives for projects, building new projects and investments, domestically, diversifying supply chains, diversifying energy sources. And we've seen this in the aftermath of the Ukraine crisis. So you've seen the EU coming to Africa to start uh, investing in LNG routes and LNG plants, particularly in North Africa, in order to create more uh, sources of energy. So this is also happening on the critical mineral side. And it shows that energy security is even more important than when we say energy access. It's about knowing that you have secure access. It could be domestically sourced or internationally sourced, but this is an issue that I think even us as Africans in Africa should take very seriously. And then sustainability. So I said resource efficiency. You think about the whole concept of circularity and how it could be applied, because certainly 
were all expected to reduce some types of practices, including unsustainable extraction as part of the, the net zero transition. So some level of efficiency will be required to change production uh, and the efficiency of operations in all resource extraction industries in, in order to achieve a higher level of sustainability. Another interesting dynamic that people have not realized is that applying some of these net zero regulations to trade actually will have a negative impact uh, on Africa. So we did some initial analysis and we saw that the carbon border adjustment mechanism, for instance, if it's applied initially is going to affect some really critical uh, exports from Africa, including fertilizers and cement, and I think steel. So these are heavy industries uh, that you see countries like South Africa or Morocco uh, concentrating on exporting these products to the EU. And they're actually the ones facing the highest carbon penalty. So in the short term, there could be significant disruptions if some products are not allowed to enter the EU because of applying uh, regulations like the car carbon budget adjustment mechanism. But there's not that much awareness about this uh, amongst African countries. And it's really time to start having a conversation on, on how the world is changing. When we talk of net zero, we focus a lot on what we should do locally, but it is a global phenomenon. And we're seeing new policies. It has an implications on Africa's principal minerals, but the question is how do we now reposition ourselves in this new landscape to ensure that we continue uh, to benefit and to create economic potentials for our populations. Okay, so this is now talking about China. So what is China's role in the battery and EV space globally? And we see that it's a very interesting dynamic. If you look across the supply chain, so you look at mining, processing, producing battery cell components, whether that's for uh, the batteries or how these batteries are used to power EVs. And China is a dominant force. So China accounts for 60% of worldwide production and 85% of processing capacity. This is both for batteries, that's batteries themselves, and then electric vehicles. So China is a dominant force globally. Uh, and it really raises questions on how uh, Africa can position itself within this global landscape and ecosystem to ensure that we have the right strategy and that we're able to maximize the opportunities which are available. Now, coming to Africa, we see again that China is a, is a dominant force, not just in mining, but in critical minerals, in countries with strategic reserves of these minerals. Uh, we talk about areas like Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Mali. And of course, in the DRC, it has a very significant presence. Uh, we note that 15 out of 17 cobalt mining operations are, are run by China. So this is the major player in critical minerals. And it's also the single largest buyer of Africa's minerals output. So the figure there for 2020 is 16.6 billion US dollars or 32%. That's close to a third of our minerals and metals output was purchased by China. They also spread across the continent. So you see all over, as you can see in the chart on, on the left, 75% of the African continent. Um, so it's just for us to understand that we need to really have a clear strategy of dealing with uh, the Chinese presence and ensuring that Africa is able to create value and benefits from this potential in critical minerals. And there are certain policy issues which are recurring across the continent. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned, is low value addition. For a very long time, our focus has been on producing raw materials or unprocessed 
minerals for export. And this is why we talk about enclave economies, where whereabouts mining is disconnected from uh, actually being able to create jobs and catalyze domestic in investments. But it happens in an enclave and the focus is on primary product, uh, production for exports. And so having this model of, of Chinese dominance is reinforcing some of these concerns locally that we are not adding value from such a high level of investment. There's another paradox that actually, when you transport these raw materials to uh, China, you're increasing GHG emissions. And what people don't realize is that for some type of clean energy technologies like solar panels, the raw materials, the minerals are produced in Africa, transported to China, used to construct the solar panels and then now imported back to Africa. So you just imagine the level of GHG emissions and we're saying this is not sustainable. There are more efficient ways to actually localize value chain. Not only that we're creating jobs, we're also now cutting down on these harmful emissions and promoting a more sustainable uh, way of production uh, and, and really helping local economies to be more sustainable. The whole issue of asymmetry in contract, asymmetry in deals, asymmetry in agreement. So look at the DRC. It's, it's a major producer of cobalt, but what does it get in terms of the rents and the revenues from investments in its cobalt? So the example we cite is uh, some of the, uh, the new resource for in infrastructure deals that have been used in countries like the DRC, Angola, Ghana, and Nigeria. And there are questions about how these contracts are structured, if they're contributing uh, to stimulating local industry and development. And with increasing awareness, uh, many African governments are trying to renegotiate these deals, although sometimes it's very difficult because of stabilization clauses and other conditions. But it's just the fact that there is no growing awareness that there have to be balanced contracts, investment agreements in order for, for us to reach what we call the win-win, that Africa is able to benefit in a substantial way from these investments. And then of course, I talked about good governance. For us as an MDB, for us as Africans to be, to be, to be more broad and, and uh, uh, candid, good governance is important. So concerns over how mining and some particular projects are contributing to environmental degradation, uh, affecting local populations, disrupting livelihoods, damaging habitats and ecosystems. And of course, if you think about this whole narrative of the resource course, people immediately point to the DRC because it's a very, um, fitting example of the contradiction between abundance and slow growth, or abundance and poverty, abundance and conflict, abundance and crisis. And perhaps that's a very simplistic understanding of, of the issues which have uh, been a challenge to a country like the DRC over the long term. But it just shows us that it's very important for African governments and African countries to change their approach. Uh, in order to benefit from these critical minerals and to create value for their economies and societies. So this is why I see the green transition is an opportunity not to repeat past uh, errors, but to learn from experience. And one thing we're seeing with the rise of the African continental free trade area is that there is more value in regional cooperation. It creates economies of scale, it reduces transaction costs, it promotes integration. And so an Africa-wide strategy is the way to go and not for countries to try and uh, develop their critical mineral resources individually. Again, as I say, don't ignore the bottom line. When we think about mineral wealth, uh, we often say it's like, a, for the nation or for the countries. And this is true, but at the end of the day, we're all people in our individual 
community. So it's about how these people, every one of us, and in local communities across Africa can benefit either directly or indirectly from developing these critical mineral assets. Because ultimately that is what matters. Uh, societies and economies are made up of people. They don't exist in, in some abstract sense. So we need to pay attention to how the benefits of these resources are being distributed across the board uh, so that everyone is able to uh, somehow benefit from their development and we're able to create jobs, livelihoods, and sustainable growth. So next is what we're calling an African Green Mineral Strategy, which is led by the AFDB in collaboration with the African Union and other partners. And Jerry will talk about this a bit after my presentation. So this is what we're saying. How can we reach that win-win? What do we need to do differently? So this has motivated us to really sit down, put on our thinking hats and say, how can we learn from the African mining vision, the experience with implementing that? At the regional level, at the national level, what has been the success? Also, what has been the drawbacks of our strategies? And so we see this structured around four pillars in order to uh, drive the development of our green minerals or critical minerals. First of all, mineral governance, developing infrastructure and bringing in capital to really explore and find new deposits and also to bring them to the market. So advancing the development of these critical minerals. Second is on skills, developing the skills and technologies so that people locally have the knowledge and capacity to participate in this growing and emerging green minerals sectors. And a very good example is uh, the Center of Excellence in Lumumbashi, which was set up by the DRC on battery minerals and EVs technologies as part of their cooperation with Zambia. And it shows that our leaders are starting to think differently, putting in place the frameworks to facilitate knowledge transfer, skills building, uh, so that Africans can equally participate in these industries. And it, it's not just an enclave, as I mentioned before. Third is on value chains. Value chains, very important. Regional value chains. I talked about regional cooperation. And then identifying priority areas and low-hanging fruits where we can make the most impact. So we talked about uh, two and three wheelers, but also solar panels, solar photovoltaics, and how we can localize the production of these uh, items. Also manufacturing lithium batteries uh, is a huge opportunity. So there are some priority areas where we can have really a huge impact in the short term. Finally, is stewardship and the circular economy. So environmental, social, and governance issues, how we can regionalize environmental policies and frameworks. Uh, we could even have regional recycling and repurposing facilities as part of that value chain. And then the circular economy in general, uh, looking at the efficiency of materials, efficiency of production processes, and a very interesting approach, um, which is emerging in mining called materials as services. So how we can even change our understanding of, of raw materials or natural resources uh, and focus less on rent and more on value. And this value is out of the services which these materials provide to our economies. But we'll talk about that going forward. So this is a nutshell of the Green Mineral Strategy Framework, which uh, Jerry will focus on shortly. So this is um, a depiction of the battery and electric vehicle supply chain. If you look at the left-hand side, this is Africa's current focus. And at the bottom of the screen, the market values, you can see the increasing scale. So if we stay just at the bottom, it's about $11 billion in terms of market value. But even moving to producing precursors in the middle, in the, in the midterm, yeah. 
um, the market value is about 271 billion. So that's almost a tenfold difference. And then if you move further along the value chain to actually assembling cells and then producing vehicles themselves, if you look at the difference between where we are and the end point, it's a huge phenomenal difference. And this is why we need to move up the value chain. If we just focus on exporting um, raw ores without any processing, we're losing out the bulk of the value that could be created. So this is just a depiction of the opportunities that Africa has in the medium term and why we need to move away from the primary end of the value chain to focusing on production, processing, you know, producing precursors, producing cells for batteries, assembling, and then also electric vehicles. Uh, so this is just to underscore the point that without creating value, we cannot benefit from resources like critical minerals. As I said, we've always had partnerships in Africa, but the question is how can we um, make these work for Africa? So this slide is just to show us some key elements of what we, we say are smart partnerships. You could have different types of partnerships. Not all partnerships are good. Some could actually uh, lead to losses, economic losses, because you're not benefiting. So we need to be very focused, very deliberate about what we're getting out of these partnerships. And some key elements, identifying and developing key critical minerals. This involves investing in exploration and then using these identified reserves to have uh, a basis to negotiate for a bigger share of the pie. One challenge we see is that we don't know the full extent of our resource endowments. And you need to have that knowledge in order to get a fair deal. So this is why we say even identifying and having a, a good knowledge of, of these critical minerals is very important. Next is having strategic partnerships. So how do we partner with China? If China is a dominant force, then we need to work with them. But we can now have a strategy of focusing on where we have a comparative advantage in that whole value chain. And we see precursor production in areas like the DRC and other countries in the region as a very good starting point. So we can even zero in on particular aspects of that value chain to start the process of increasing local value, increasing local processing and industrialization. Then what types of policies and incentives can we use to attract investments? It's clear it's not going to be only the public sector that can mobilize the resources needed. We need private investment. But also, this is based on governments providing incentives. So we can say that uh, in many African countries, there, there's um, a huge emphasis on fossil fuel subsidies. We could even see how some of these subsidies are channeled or refo refocused into areas like um, batteries and EVs value chain, or some green sectors in order to promote and enhance private investments. Can you still hear me? I think there's something wrong. Yeah, we can, hear, we can hear you clearly. We can hear you clearly. My screen, I think. We can hear you. My screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can still see your screen now. We can hear you. Yeah, you know, tech, tech is always funny. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've been told I'm old fashioned, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not the most tech wise, but let me try and move forward. Yes, yeah, so this yeah, is just, just, all right, cool. Please, excuse me. So, um, other elements of this framework of re revisiting our, our, our approach to partnerships. So, I said regional integration and cooperation. There's more benefits in working together as a continent. You can leverage more economies of scale. You can also reduce the transaction costs as opposed to countries negotiating deals, building plants, uh, and making investments on their own. 
Next is technology, research and development. The future we see is going to be driven by technology, by knowledge, by data. And Africa has to be at the forefront of this revolution, investing more in, in R&D. This could be through private-public partnerships. But how do we build that innovation? If you want to be competitive, then this is very important. And there's also an, an, another dimension of skilling. So these skills have to be built. We have the youngest population in the world. We need schemes that actually support skills building, which can feed into our ambitions to develop battery and electric vehicles value chain to become a force to reckon with in the green transition. And so that's why I mentioned the scheme, the Center of Excellence in Mumbashi. And there are other opportunities we see across the region, and these need to be scaled up. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Sometimes looking at the statistics, you, you get really uh, amazed at how much we need. I think our latest analysis says at over $100 billion annually. This is across the continent. So this is why there needs to be regional cooperation. A very effective tool that we've used in the AFDB is on special economic zones, particularly on agro-processing. But these are going to be very important to be able to address the huge infrastructure costs. If you think of transportation, if you think of energy, roads, all these are needed if we really want to uh, develop local processing, local industries on the basis of our critical minerals. So all of these factors, which we, we see as very critical should feature in partnership agreements. We need to move from just uh, looking at how much revenues we can get to really seeing an opportunity to create value. Once you create value, you can leverage more revenues and more rent simply because of the scale of activities involved. So um, all these are elements that we, we see and we say smart partnerships, because as I said, you could have bad partnerships and also good ones. So we need to make the right choices. Okay, so next, in conclusion, just to recap some of the points I made, energy transition is minerals intensive. And some people say it's a paradox, but that's the reality. It's an opportunity for Africa as well. What can we do differently? Learn from experience. We have the experience. Hundreds of years, in fact, in fact thousands of years of mining. Because as, as some would say, and Jerry would agree with me, people say, if it's not farmed, it's mined. We don't even realize how much mining underscores uh, modern societies and civilizations. So we have huge experience we can learn on what not to do and what to do. And we talked about smart partnerships, smart partnerships that can lead Africa to the win-win. Understanding how some of these new uh, geopolitical dynamics, new regulations, new policies, new frameworks really constrain Africa's ability to maximize benefits of these minerals. So how do we position ourselves? And it's linked to the, to the previous point on smart partnerships. So we need to be very deliberate about positioning. And the next point is linked to the others as well. Regional cooperation is very important. So the continental free trade area is an opportunity. We can build on that and create regional mineral value chains as part of this uh, new mindset and approach. And this is a core element of our green mineral strategy, as I mentioned. Next is looking at how people and communities can benefit from developing green minerals or critical minerals. So when we think of value chains, we think of industrial value chains, but they don't have to only be about industry. We can see how communities are integrated in the whole ecosystem of critical minerals. It could just be focused on elements of resource efficiency, recycling, repurposing, circularity, environmental management. And we have models that work. And people participating, of course, I talked about skills building. So people being uh, able to have the 
capacity to participate in these new industries, skills building, knowledge, education, training, working in the private sector. Communities themselves have to be seen as stakeholders. And I think we all have experiences on, on what has worked and not worked across the continent. So bring all of that into focus. But the, the key thing is that we tend to sometimes forget that it's about people. So it's about you and I and others, just like us across, <laughs> across this continent and how uh, we need to bring that into the strategy. Then yeah. focusing on good governance. Okay, I'm rounding up very soon. Thank so you. Like, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Good governance, leadership, um, and how we can make good deals. So deals that work based on a clear understanding of the opportunities, the risks, the challenges. And we hope that this green renewal strategy would help to inform good policies. Next is value. How do we create value, economic value? So creating new value chains for batteries and electric vehicles, trade, industry, markets, um, social value as well, skills building. How can we create jobs for local communities? There's this phenomenon we see because we're so heavily resource dependent, particularly on extractives. There's a risk of having stranded communities because when there's now a decline in, in demand for certain fossil fuels, we see this in, in coal, for instance, what happens to those mining communities? They could just be left behind. So if we have a new opportunity to build this critical mineral sector, they could such communities which are at risk of stranding, stranding because we think of stranding as assets, in terms of assets, but people could be stranded if they have nothing, no alternative. So how do we integrate com uh, communities impacted by climate change into these new opportunities? More inclusive economies. And then finally, the environment, looking at circularity, repurposing, and how we can use resources more responsibly. Finally, is to say that we want to promote an approach that looks at natural resources in terms of assets as our natural assets that we need to invest in in order to create value. And this is why the materials and services concept and approach is so important and something that we want to explore going forward. So let me just stop there. I must have overspoken, but I hope you have. No, that's and, absolutely yeah. fine. No, that's okay. absolutely fine. I think for the sake of time, we'll just jump to uh, um, the Q&A. Um, there's quite a few questions that have come in. I think what we'll do is there's a few questions that I explicitly mentioned the AFDB. Um, so I'll leave that to you guys to answer. But I will answer a couple of the questions that I think directly relate to the work that the ACF is doing. So I think... Um, Chiugo Agaji is asking um, about shedding more light on CBAM um, and how calculations around CBAM are working. So the ACF has actually been doing quite a lot of work um, on CBAM. And for the benefit of those, I guess, who might not know what CBAM is, CBAM stands for Carbon uh, Border Adjustment Mechanism. And it's this idea that it's a regulation that would require importers of certain energy intensive goods uh, to effectively pay a tariff or a levy. Um, in respect of their uh, imports um, that all sort of relates to the price of emissions allowance under the EU emissions trading systems. What the ACF has actually done is we've written what is effectively the first report that highlights um, what the impact of the CBAM will be on Africa. And interestingly, the Chinese, um, I guess the Chinese um, representatives at the World Trade Organization have actually quoted that report to talk about some of the negative or at least potentially negative economic impacts that CBAM will have. I think what we can do after this is share that report uh, for anyone who's interested, but um, is effectively looking at the implications of the report and the fact that, uh, sorry, of CBAM and the fact that effectively CBAM is going to have a negative um, a negative effect on Africa's GDP um, if it's implemented in its current form um, on the continent. So, um, Chugo, I'm happy to share more um, on that uh, for the team. Um, this is a question from Stacy. Um, I, I guess I'll just forward this to the <laughs> Mr. Jerry uh, and the AFDB team. But the question is looking at how do we talk, tackle challenges? Um, so let me just sort of read the preamble. There is a conundrum in the value and supply chain of EVs, um, increasing ESG compliance regulations, particularly from China, but also uh, 
particularly from the EU, but also China, are shrinking the space for the continuation of international supply of EVs. Many of the e of the ESG challenges stem from within the African mining context itself. You know, you sort of look at proclivity for corruption and all of that. Um, what we also know so far is that China's behavior um, as it relates to ESG is largely driven by the host country. So the question is, how do we tackle these challenges given the huge uh, problems of ESG within the mining sector itself so that Africa does not lose out on valuable markets such as the EU? Um, yeah, so that, that's the question, uh, Mr. Jerry. Are, are you able to um, answer that? Yes, 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 yeah. So thank you very much. And um, Vanessa, thank you, you know, for the presentation. I mean, it's been very, very clear. Yes, and so you see mineral stewardship is one of the pillars of the green minerals strategy. And so under that, um, we have, you know, these ESG aspects and um, the circularity, reduce, reuse, recycle. And so what the AFDB, I mean, is doing is to assist countries, you know, in improving their um, policy, legal and regulatory frameworks, you know, regarding this ESG aspects in the mining sector. I mean, we all do agree that ESG is not a new phenomenon, but um, because, I mean, in the past we had, you know, this EIA, ESIA, I mean, et cetera. But due to the uh, increasing environmental concerns, you know, I mean, we need to deepen the environmental awareness, you know. So the bank is actually supporting countries, you know, I mean, in these aspects to improve uh, the uh, regulatory frameworks, you know, in order to address, I mean, all these um, challenges in the mining sector. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this ties into the next question, which is what is the AFDB doing to support countries to enter mining agreements favorably uh, for national That's development, right. given infrastructure, information, and technical knowledge asymmetry? Yeah. So with this, the I mean, AFDB um, has a department called the Africa Legal Realm Support Facility, you know, that assists countries in negotiating mineral agreements. And this support is pro bono. Um, 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 I mean, countries just need to approach the AS, ALSF, you know, that, okay, maybe we are entering into agreement and we need support. Um, then the ALSF <coughs> will send <coughs> its lawyers, you know, to do due diligence on what um, actually the agreement is all about. And then if they don't even have the in-house capability, you know, they will hire uh, very reputable, I mean, law firms, you know, and then work with them in order to um, assist the country. Yeah, so, I mean, the AFDB is in this space as well, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think, again, just <laughs> sticking to what the AFDB is doing, um, there's a question from Patrick about, are there are there initiatives already in place by AFDB towards supporting the African mining strategy? So, for example, how can the idea of special economic zones be financed regionally? That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, as Vanessa said, the AFDB is leading the development of the African Green Minerals Strategy. And in doing this, we have recognized, you know, that creation of development of special economic zones, I mean, is key. And so um, in 2021, we did some work with uh, the Economic Commission of Africa uh, and the DRC government, you know, where we saw that, I mean, the outcome of that work, you know, was that it is three times cheaper, you know, to produce battery precursors in the DRC than in the US or in um, Europe or in China. And so an outcome of that uh, report and business forum is that there's been an agreement between the DRC and Zambia, you know, to establish uh, the battery precursor plants, you know, around the borders of the two countries. So special economic zones, you know, I mean, are going to be created. And the 
AFDB is part of, I mean, a group of institutions like UCA, uh, AFDB, African Bank, AFC, et cetera, uh, assisting the two governments, you know, to set up this special economic zone. Uh, in actual fact, a pre-feasibility study is currently being developed, you know, to give us, I mean, all the project pipelines and its viability um, among others. By October, this will be completed. Yeah. Thank you so much. There's a question here. This is this is an interesting one. Um, how does green mining avoid the mistakes of crude oil extraction, especially with respect to environmental damage and refining minerals to create more value? Any, yes. any impact on that? <laughs> yes, I think, I mean, I spoke about the fourth pillar um, in the strategy already being, you know, I mean, a focus now, more on a mineral stewardship and a circular economy um, is extremely important um, if we want to reduce, you know, the greenhouse gases, you know, in the green minerals industry. Currently, we are even talking about, I mean, hydrogen. So the use of renewable energy, you know, to produce steel, you know, I mean, green steel, and all that. And then also the need to decarbonize uh, the mining fleet. I mean, we, we, we have some companies already changing their vehicles, you know, to EVs, you see? Yeah, so, I mean, all this is um, aimed towards, you know, I mean, decarbonizing the, 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 the mining industry and renewable energy is going to play a huge role. And I mean, as we are all aware that, I mean, Africa has potential, you know, to produce this renewable energy from its hydro, solar, I mean, geothermal resources among others. Yeah, so it's one of the key pillars in the green minerals strategy. You are muted. I'm talking to myself. Isn't that fun? Um, <laughs> um, I, I think just, just in the spirit of sharing more about the AFDB's work, um, there's a question here about, could you please share uh, some of the successes the AFDB has had in supporting mining developments um, or any sort of substantial capital contributions the AFDB has made? Yes. I mean, the AFDB um, has made a lot of... Um, contribution, you know, to Africa's mining sector. Let me just give some few examples. Um, if you go to OCP Morocco, I mean, we supported the, the phosphate, you know, mining project there, you know, that um, has a lot of economic benefits. And it's not direct mining alone, but we support infrastructure, you know, around the business to make the business Viable. So, I mean, if I'm talking about the Morocco intervention, is the mining, then including infrastructure, I mean, around it. If you, we have projects as well in Nigeria, port expansion, you know, to feed the mining industry in Madagascar, nickel projects, then even in the artisanal and small scale mining area, we are supporting, I mean, projects in Sierra Leone, Liberia. And this is aimed at even improving um, information capture. You know, the ASM area is very critical. One of the key challenges is that information is very scarce. And so, I mean, our projects in Sierra Leone and Liberia, aside, you know, the, I mean, formalization aspect, we want to improve information um, capture. You know, um, like, I mean, if the regulators go to the field, they should be able to capture information in real time, which will reflect in the office. And this will serve as basis, you know, for policy making among others. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this kind of ties into uh, this, this conversation around information ties into the next question, which is the question is, could you say a couple of words on ASM sector in Africa and data collection around small scale mining? 
Uh, uh, you see? So, so there you go. Yes. Yeah, so the ASM sector, I mean, it's a challenging one. Um, and so the bank uh, knows that this sector actually uh, can contribute, you know, to Africa's unemployment. I mean, it can contribute to creating employment in Africa. And so we have a focus on that and we are supporting a number of countries, you know, across um, East, West uh, Africa, even Southern Africa, we are in South Sudan, Chad, and the, the ECOWAS region as well. And we uh, this support actually is aimed at improving the formalization. I mean, moving them, you know, from uh, the informal activities, you know, into at least cooperatives that um, can be assisted, you know, by um, the state. Yes, and so once you bring them into the formal economy, it is easy to control them. It is easy um, as well, you know, to get uh, the information which will be used, you know, as basis for policy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm just very conscious of time. I think we've run over about, sure. about a few minutes. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Jerry, I don't know if there's any sort of last uh, closing remarks you want to make before I wrap up. Yeah. Uh, everyone can be on their way. That's right. Yeah. So thank you very much. <clears throat> so what is the new model that um, we are championing? The new model is smart championships, smart partnerships. So using minerals, you know, as a service and not just, you know, as, as a commodity. The lesson we can learn from China in this green minerals and EV industry is state support. So the state supported companies, you know, um, with incentives, uh, with, with offtake agreements, because if they want a company to produce about 1,000 or 10,000 EVs, the state will say that, okay, we'll absorb all. And these vehicles, you know, will be bought by the states and distributed, you know, to um, state institutions. So if the market is there, the businessman can now borrow money and invest into the business. So this is one key thing, you know, um, that Africa must, also learn. And Vanessa has uh, already made this point, but it is also critical that Africa invest in mineral exploration, you know, to ensure that we know what we have and that will underpin negotiations. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so thank you so much, uh, Vanessa and Jerry. Thank you so much. Um, I realize we do have quite a few more questions. I think what I would invite uh, any anyone with more questions, please connect with um, the ACF team, connect with myself. We're happy to have more of these conversations. I think this is part of an ongoing series um, that the African Climate Foundation, China Africa team is organizing to have more of these discussions as they relate to you know climate change and Africa's development. So you know we welcome questions. We welcome um, follow us on Twitter. Uh, connect with us on LinkedIn and you're always welcome to you know send us emails via our website so thank you so much for your time everyone uh, please enjoy the rest of your day uh, wherever you are um, and if there's any more questions again we'll send around the recordings we'll send around whatever information we can share um, and we always welcome your feedback thank you.